We are live. This is Mike Wall. Welcome back to another episode of the Agent Revolution podcast where we deconstruct the biggest challenges facing today's real estate agent. By the way, we are sponsored by Mike Wall Live. Um, we do this so that you all, you being real estate agents, can build a sustainable, profitable, but most of all, fulfilling real estate business. Um, super excited today. I'm joined by my friend, mega agent Alex Rivlin out in Henderson, Nevada, which is right outside of Las Vegas, if you guys don't know where that is at. And we are discussing the difference between owning a job and owning a business in real estate. Hey, don't forget, you can get more great real estate content for free at, in fact, we have about eight hours worth of content now for free over at MikeWallLive.com. Alex, are you ready to rock and roll, my man? I am ready to rock and roll. I, you know, I would have pan my camera over by about two feet to show you my drum kit that was in my office. But now that we're working from home and I've had to hire more people and I need some of them here with me, I've had to reconfigure. So my drum kit went in a closet. Oh, but I love it. It's not being played though. It's still being played. You, it's set up in my closet. You ever go drum solo during work hours? <laughs> you know, every once in a while you need to get that aggression out and you just <laughs> put it down on those heads and you know, get some metal going on. And yeah, for sure. <laughs> oh, that's awesome, man. That's awesome. Well, um, so give us a quick backstory on you, man. Give us your, uh, give us your, everybody has their own unique real estate story. What's yours? Sure. So I mean, uh, the, the brief version, born and raised in New York, uh, definitely have that, you know, I, as some would call it, East Coast work ethic and started working when I was 10 years old. Started my first business at 18 and I call real estate Alex 4.0. Uh, it's my fourth business and three of the others were, were fairly major businesses. At 18 years old, I was in auto repair. I started growing the largest uh, independent farmers insurance agency uh, through my 20s. And then I got into technology and I actually grew a business from myself. I was the founder and CEO and I brought in a partner that knew more about the product than I did and grew that from two employees to 165 employees in a matter of about three years. Wow. Uh, so we've gotten mentions in Inc. Magazine, Forbes. Uh, so some fairly good business pedigree behind me. And as I was exiting that business, we've sold off to our largest, uh, our largest enterprise client. Um, not as good as it sounds, honestly. Uh, I, I don't want to make it sound uh, better than it is. Uh, the Affordable Care Act had a major impact on our technology business since it was in the healthcare space. So we sold at, at a much lower multiple than we wanted to. So I was looking for the next thing to do. And one of the things that I always look at is when there's problems in a business, when there's systemic issues in a particular industry or business, that usually means there's opportunity within that business. Because if you can figure out the better mousetrap, so to speak, you can get into that business and do a great job. So I looked at the real estate business and I looked at the attrition rates that we all know about, right? The 80% plus failure rate in the first three to five years. And I thought about it and said, you know, if I go and interview anybody that went and got their license and went and paid all their association dues and they're coming out with that smile on their face, that bounce in their step, ready to go. And I said, what are you planning on doing this career? The Vegas odds would, would give you a hundred to one that they're not going to say, you know, I like dabbling in a lot of things, probably in the next eight months to maybe 24 months, I'll give up the license because, you know, I just like trying things, you know, for a little while. Nobody's saying that. Everybody's thinking they're getting into this for, you know, for greener pastures, big commission checks, everything else. And it doesn't happen that way, right? 80% plus do give up their license. So when I saw that, I didn't say, oh, that's an opportunity. I could get into real estate and sell a lot of real estate. I just have to be better then. I actually looked at it as an opportunity. How can I help other agents? How can I bring other agents into a place where maybe, you know, they're great at sales. They're great at organization. They're not necessarily great at all of those things combined. And so I got into real estate with an immediate idea of a team structure and running it like a business. So it's funny you opened up saying working on your business instead of in your business. So, you know, age old Michael Gerber, E-Myth, uh, you know, quote or statement. And that's the way I look at it is if you synthesize it, if you make it where, you know, this is what you have to do. These are your daily tasks as an agent, then any agent can succeed. It's just a matter of following it, just like a discipline of going to the gym or staying on a diet or just about anything else you want to know or, or learn. Yeah, yeah. That's so interesting, man, because when I started into the business, um, I also came in with the idea of starting a team. 
And that, that was what I was working towards. And, you know, um, it's different. I think it's just a mindset shift, right? I think it's, you know, when you go in and with the end in mind, it's like you almost always arrive, right? And if you go into real estate and you're, the idea of real estate for you is just being a realtor and always working with buyers and sellers and not really having an exit strategy, then that's really all you're ever going to do. Um, not to say that there aren't people that uh, go through some sort of a natural evolution, uh, business evolution, and they start to realize, mm -hmm. hey, this is, this is not what I want for myself for the rest of my life. I do. I want to grow out a team so I can ultimately serve more people, right, and make more money. Um, but one thing I wonder, Alex, is um, most agents um, – most agents don't go out there with the idea of owning a business. They, they always look at it from the perspective of, um, you know, an employee or having a job. And I'm just curious why that is. And that may not necessarily be a bad thing because I know some people enjoy doing that, but ultimately we look through a different lens, right? And, and we have to, we, we wonder, I mean, I think we, it would be, I think it would be odd if we didn't, we wonder why more people wouldn't want that because essentially what you're buying as you scale a real estate team is hopefully some level of freedom and time, right? For sure. And I think what it comes down to is when you look at business owners by and large, or, you know, uh, CEOs, COOs of major companies, and you look at the number of them versus the population, it's yeah. a very small percentage. It's just like, you know, to make it to the NBA or the Major League Baseball or NFL, it's such a small percentage of the population. And it's still a small percentage of those that played high school ball or even college ball. Yeah. But when you really look at the numbers, it is. So that business minded entrepreneur, it, they're not better. You know, it's not that, you know, I'm better because I, of business. Right. It's, that's where my strength lies. That's just something that I'm good at. I'm terrible at basketball. I've got no shot. I'm not good at finished carpentry. There's so many things I'm not good at that people are better. So it's not a, it's a better at something, not, you're not a better person. There's nobody that's yeah. a better person for it, right? But it's just, what are your strengths? And I think what happens is we do have fairly low barrier to entry in real estate cool. and big commissions. And one of the things that I see, uh, you know, kind of to your point, elaborating a little further on it, is that agents get in and they look at the real estate commission check as money earned. And most business people don't look at that as money earned. They look at that as top line revenue right. and has overhead against it. And when you talk to these same people and you ask them a restaurant, a doctor's office, an auto repair shop, um, any other traditional business, and you know, say if you paid a thousand to get something repaired on your car, do you think that the owner gets a thousand dollars? And they go, well, no, they have, they, they have to pay for parts. They had to, you know, pay their, their mechanic. They had to pay their overhead for their shop. They had to pay for advertising, you know, and they're left with a certain percentage, but yet for some reason, a $10,000 commission check comes in, they think they go to their pocket. I mean, taxes aside, you know, some people are smart about putting the taxes aside. Some people wait until it wallops down at the end of the year or into the next year. But aside from the taxes, there is still a business to be run. And I, I don't know if there's a statistic out there, but I would beg to say that those that look at the whole check, again, taking the taxes out and keeping very, very minimal overhead, uh, there's some anomalies, but take the anomalies out, right? Take those outliers out. And I'm gonna say that the agent that treats their business that way is capped at maybe 20 to 25 transactions a year. And that's a really stellar agent that has a huge SOI. Yeah. Any other agent that wants to get past that, wants to get to 40 or 50 or be a solo agent doing 100, and there are several out there, they have to run it like a business. And guess what that's gonna come with? Probably an overhead in the area of 50 to 60%. Yeah. Right, because they need staff, they need lead generation, they need systems, they need CRMs, they, they, you know, everything that comes with that there's a cost, but they're not operating it necessarily like a business. Yeah. Why do you think, um, and, and I get that. I think that I love your analogy of the CEO or the, you know, the NBA player, NFL player. It is true. And, and that is not everybody's strong suit. And I think oftentimes, you know, as entrepreneurs, 
um, with a CEO mentality, we have a, a challenge looking through a different lens, right? We think everybody should want what we want. And, <laughs> and it's just, it's not reality. In other words, in, in the reality of it is we wouldn't exist without those other people, right? And those other people wouldn't exist without us because, you know, we're all a, a means to an end. Like they need us as much as we need them. But there are those people out there I know who, and I know they're in our environment and probably in your environment where you want to, they ultimately want to grow a business. They don't have a business right now, or they have what they're calling a business. It's not actually a business because if they stop working, their their revenue goes away, right? And that's that's not a business, that's a job, right? That's that that's like working at McDonald's, right? When you're off the clock, you're not getting paid. When you're on the clock, you are. That's a job. For sure. And so um, I, I, I wonder why, um, you know, people are, are at what point in, some, in someone's business do they have that paradigm shift to where they think, um, you know, okay, so I, I'm making money, right? I have expenses. Um, now I want to leverage myself, right? I want to, you know, I want to potentially grow out a team. And, and I, this is not an EXP commercial by any stretch of the imagination, but we had this conversation with our team on Monday at our meeting. It's that I want them to focus on right now uh, building teams. And what I mean by that is I want them to I want them to share their story with other agents in our in our area. And I want them to see if there is an opportunity for them to come and join us to grow their business. And essentially, they're growing teams within our team. Does that make sense? And then yeah. they become responsible for, you know, the productivity of that other agents because they know our tools and systems so well. And the good thing about our business model is we've taken that off our agents' plates, so they're not responsible for that. Doesn't doesn't mean doesn't mean that they don't have expenses of their own because some of them do their own lead generation. But if they can take this model and share it with them and build their own teams, they're essentially running their own P&L. Does that make sense? Yeah, to a degree. I, I see where you're going with that. And um, so I just I just wonder, like, why if you go to like a traditional brokerage um, where you don't have opportunities like that, I wonder at what point do you think those folks realize that? You know, I, I've kind of hit I, I've kind of hit a uh, a plateau here. I can't I can't continue to grow or build out a a P and L type business at a traditional brokerage because they don't support that. Sure. So I, and and I see where you're putting that, and I guess I look at it a little bit different. That I put each in its own vertical. Okay. Right. So getting back to the to the NBA player, knowing what your strengths are and what your weaknesses are. Um, you know, some people just aren't going to be strong at being the quote unquote business owner, as you said, owning your job. So then what they should be doing in you know, my perspective is you're strong. So if you are a strong real estate agent, keep a real estate agent mm -hmm. and then provide yourself paths of passive income. So you have that income quasi business owner, right? Whether that's rental properties, whether that's, whether that's bringing on agents under you that could put on a PL, uh, so to speak, from uh, uh, either mini, you know, even before I was with EXP, I had done that where I promoted that if an agent brought an agent in under them, instead of giving them a cash bonus, that they could actually, as long as they're willing to mentor them, could get an override commission opportunity. Uh, so if they can like that, but it doesn't necessarily mean they're cut out you know, vet marketing plans and hire people and fire people and build systems and uh, maintain accountability and, and basically do the, um, I'm not a big KPI person, um, but effectively still run the KPIs, right? If you look at McDonald's, there is a system for everything. There is a way to, for everything to happen. So it's a mega complicated business that's brought down to very, very simple systems to, to, reduce the failure rate. I mean, is there that goes in there and just doesn't figure out how to put the pack together? You know, they put two patties and two buns together and, you know, there's no center bun. Like, you know, do they forget that and ultimately get terminated? Sure. But yeah. most people that go in there are able to assemble the Big Mac. There's a system for assembling the Big Mac. So, but the person that developed those systems, you know, take Ray Kroc and Fred Turner, 
uh, who really developed those systems and who placed all the equipment in specific places, right? That original one that the McDonald's brothers did, if you watch the founders, you know, they had everything set up. Well, you know, the restaurants have evolved since then, but all that was set up. Some people don't have that business mind and it's okay. That's okay to admit that. If I go into a different analogy, doctors, right? How many doctor's offices were private practices because they wanted to own their business and now they're owned by a much larger clinic conglomerate, right? Health partners or some of these other ones. Many of my friends that are doctors that had private practices decided to merge in. They got a nice cash payment, but they also got to lift that weight off their shoulders. They said, you know what? I'm really awesome at being a doctor. I'm not so awesome at being a business person. It is a different hat. And, you know, that's one of the things that I tell my team members is that one of the things that you don't see is that on the back end, I'm always looking at systems. I'm always looking at, you know, if you were marketing in 2010 and you just continue doing that marketing and you didn't change up that marketing to new marketing, you know, whether it be Facebook marketing or YouTube or uh, different ways to get, you know, to generate uh, in incoming bottom of funnel leads, right? Yeah. If you weren't doing that and you're doing the age old thing, not to say that that doesn't work anymore, but you're, you know, if you're not growing, you're dying. So. Or to get more granular to, buyers versus sellers, right? In 2010, we might've been in more of a buyer's market. Now we're in more of a seller's market, at least here in Ohio. Exactly. So you've right. got to transition accordingly, right? And if you're not keeping your finger on the pulse and the problem is, is when you're mired in the business, it's hard to keep your finger on the pulse. Same thing yeah. again, going back to the doctor. That's the issue. That's why the doctor has the manager and the front staff and the insurance yeah. department and everything else. So, you know, so if you're not cut out to be a, a team leader, a team owner of the business person, that's okay. Like I said, there's nothing better about it, right? Is, is Phil Jackson better than Michael Jordan, you know, throughout the nineties bowls? No, they just each have their own strengths and Michael Jordan, you know, retired and he became an owner, not a, not a manager, not a coach. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And there's a reason for it. It's it's probably just not his strength. So yeah. he recognizes that and opts not to do it. Yeah. It's like we almost always work for somebody. Right. It's like we work like we you and I just happen to be at EXP. Right. We know Glenn Sanford is the owner of or at least one of the owners of EXP or EXPI. And mm -hmm. it's like, you know, it, one of the things I wonder or I guess I have a hard time with is that when you explain what the difference between being a business owner is and having a job, it's like most people would say they want to be a business owner, right? Because, because what the business owner has to do or what essentially what you do when I, when I, when I, when I explain to you about the difference between a business owner and having a job, it's that, you know, when you have a job, your, your, your money doesn't show up unless you clock in or clock in and clock out. Right. But as a business owner, if you get your business to a certain point, you should then be able to go on vacation or, or go away and, and start another business. And theoretically, your business would still to make uh, would still make generate income. Correct. Absolutely. Who would say no to that? I'm just curious. Well, I, I, that's the issue. I don't think many people say no to that. I think they say, yes. however, they're not equipped to execute on that. Yes, they're not. Again, Throw me on the basketball court, even, you know, with some high school players and I'm going to be the worst guy out there, but definitely throw me in, in, in the NBA and you're going to see me fail miserably. Yeah. And then, and then, let me add on to that real quick though, because it's not necessary because I don't, I don't, I don't want people to, to listen to this and think, Oh my gosh, I'm, 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 I'm not a good business owner now. It's not that you couldn't be a good business owner. It's not that you couldn't be a good basketball player. It's where is your passion, right? And exactly. you alluded to it a couple minutes ago when you said, if your passion is to be a great real estate agent, that's fantastic. Double down on that. Be a great real estate agent. But if your passion is to one day transition into becoming a business owner, then double down on that. Understand and know who you are. Uh, as it relates to your skill set. Would you agree? Absolutely. And and be truthful and honest with yourself, though. If you see that the writing is on the wall, that you need work and you need help, get the coach, read the books. I mean, there's several of them out there. Uh, not several. There's hundreds of them out there. 
You know, there's a lot of groups out there that you can type in what is the best business book or, you know, find a reading list. And there's a wealth of information. I would start with the E-Myth, honestly. It's such a great yeah, book. Great. By the way, that was one of the probably the first 20 books I read. I loved it. Um, I, I think it's it's a it's an easy read and um, people will get a lot from that. So let me ask you this real quick, um, because I know like you and I got into the business kind of the same way. We had this idea that we would build a team. Um, oftentimes, though, that's not the way people enter the business and it becomes an action of necessity. Right. Because what happens is you hit a plateau and you can't grow anymore unless you unless you add leverage right and so you know then that the 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 agent has this epiphany it's like i'm working 100 hours a week i'm doing everything i'm showing houses i'm listing houses i'm uh, negotiating contracts i'm negotiating post inspections and then you know they think well and now they have plenty of resources and i know back then they didn't and then the, and then they think well i need i need to add someone in and if you've ever read the red book and i hope you know anyone watching this who's trying to grow a team has they always say to hire the most non-dollar productive work in first and it's usually it's an admin and I'm sorry all you admin I love you and I wouldn't live without you but the reality of it is you hire that administrative piece out first and by the way most people that are salespeople are not good at admin work and vice versa and so it's a good thing when that happens in the in in and when you hire your first admin the idea is that it then frees up more time for you to be in your dollar productive activities. What, correct? Absolutely. Again, you know, sorry, I, I'm the analogy king. People tell me that all the time. But the doctor that is starting in business doesn't say, you know "What? I got to really put things together, and I want to make money as possible." So I'm going to be the front desk clerk and type in your intake form, then I'm going to call your insurance company to get the pre-authorization to make sure your insurance is valid and enforced. Then I'm going to take it to the back and then you, then I'm going to come back out. Oh, I went to copy something for you. The copying machine's on the fritz. So I'm going to call the copy repair man. And now I'm going to call the insurance company to bill them and then bill you the remainder that the insurance company doesn't cover, right? They're not saving money like that. Most real estate agents that get in do that. So that's why I do say, even if you want to own a business down the line, uh, unless you're willing to go in and invest in it right off the bat, you likely should join a team to see what the structure is yeah. and get that down, get really good at what you do and figure out where your strengths are and then grow from there. And there's no such thing as scaling a business where you wear all the hats. There's no such thing. It doesn't exist because um, you can't scale. Um, so you're 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 about to do uh, or last year. I think you did roughly 20 million bucks You're three years in man, you're crushing it. What is the, what is the, and, and I know where you're going because we talked about it before the show, but let's not go there quite yet. Where are you at in your business right now? What is your, what is your overall structure look like? So I currently, uh, structurally, I have one admin. Uh, I have one, uh, we call him director of agency development. He is, he is somewhat of an operations officer. He helps me build out my systems. Uh, so if you've ever read the uh, Gino Wickman book, Rocket Fuel or Traction, there's the visionary and there's the integrator, right? I'm not a very good admin. I'm not, you know, I, I get a fair amount of stuff implemented, but not nearly as much as I should from the standpoint of the ideas that I'm always having. Right. Um, the, he actually asked me right after he first met me, he said, do you ever sleep? Because by the next morning, you're spouting off another 25 ideas. And, yeah. uh, but he has to also put me in check and tell me, no, we're not doing that. You know, we're... You know, we've got this other thing to do. That's going to be down the line. Uh, and then I currently have five agents on the team. Okay. Uh, so what we're really working on now, because my uh, director of agency development just started with me uh, in in July, uh, we are literally putting together and documenting every single system. We are doing everything from documentation to loom videos. Uh, we are building a full onboarding program. So when somebody comes in, they step-by-step step know exactly what to do, exactly how to handle a lead, exactly how to market in our CRM. Um, you know, we talk a lot about uh, what we call STC, which is status tags and campaign, right? It, the, the lead has to be in the right status. It has to have the right tags and it has to have the right campaign. A lot of people think tags are evergreen, that they stay on there forever. To me, they're not. I happen to be a Ylopo user, so I get these priority alerts. 
right? When somebody's come back to the site and maybe you know looked at the same property five times. Well, when that happens, that Y priority tag goes on there, it pops up in, in an active list. Mm-hmm. Well, what we want to do is when we call the person, if we don't get a hold of them, we leave them there. If we actually get a hold of them and they tell us they're six months out, great. We put the proper tag on it to show six, you know, six to nine months. And we have to then delete that tag. It's a simple click of an X and it deletes the tag. The reason being is one, we don't want to keep calling on them over and over again. So when you've got thousands of leads in the database, you're going to do that and you're going to look incompetent. The second reason is that if that tag is on there and three weeks later, they go and do something again and you didn't delete that tag, you don't know they went and did that unless you look at every single lead and you don't have the time to investigate that. So let the systems be the leverage for you. So delete the tag, three weeks later, it comes back. That does warrant a call, even though they said six to nine months. If they came back and looked at a property five or six times, it's a reason to have a conversation and build more rapport. So we are literally putting everything into systems. I mentioned earlier McDonald's. McDonald's doesn't have a manual on how to run McDonald's. McDonald's has micro manuals. Again, a manual on how to cook the fries and how to build a Big Mac and how to open the store and how to close the store and how to batch the, the credit card transactions. Every one of those is its system. And it seems hyper complicated, but it's actually extremely simple because there is a very specific way to do every single thing. And then you just put it to the people that are accountable for those things and everything runs like a well-oiled machine. Right. Most of the work is done on the front end in creating those micro manuals. That's the hard part. Once that's been created, everything should be easy from that point forward. I say that tongue in cheek. We know how this business is not easy by any stretch of the imagination, but you know where I'm going with that. Um, So you're three years in, you've got five agents and a couple of admin. Um, How did you scale so quickly, my man? Uh, again, I, I came in literally from the very beginning with the idea of building this. Uh, so I actually, uh, when I when I started in the business, I went five months without even trying to get a sale. I, I built out a robust website. I chose a CRM. I put campaigns together. Uh, I put certain systems together. Nowhere near as elaborate as what I'm doing now. Uh, but I put those together. And then I had my first agent uh, within... Uh, well, like I said, I, I did that five months and I had my first agent, I think a month and a half after that, about six weeks after that. And then a couple of deals came to me. I have, again, a background in business pedigree. I've been in Vegas for 27 years now. So I did have, you know, at that time it was 24 years. So I did have, you know, a pretty significant sphere of influence. And that sphere of influence was a fairly strong sphere of influence. I'm going to versus the 50 50 home ownership rate my sphere was probably more like a 80 20 90 10 home ownership rate so i did have some people that came to me and already trusted that i would get the job right even though i was new and i am in production myself right now. um i would like to have that waiver off over the next uh you know probably 12 months uh down to virtually nothing except for you know that anomaly of somebody that's such a close friend that wants my hands directly involved in it uh, right. But yeah, so I literally started off with building it as a business. So just like my last company, my technology company, it was me. I brought in a founder, a uh, co-founder that uh, that knew the product well. And then from there, we went and raised capital. And we raised uh, just shy of a million dollars. And we started building the business and hiring people and built, you know, buying server stacks and uh, renting co-location facilities. And then subsequently we raised another 2 million on top of that. And we continued to grow the business and turn it into a multi-million dollar business that was profitable for the last five years that we were in business. And, uh, and I looked at it just the same. This time I didn't bring in any investor money. I had my own working capital and I went in and, you know, this is again where some people don't, you know, aren't necessarily prepared, but I went in and put just shy of a hundred thousand dollars in to build this before I sold my first property. Yeah. yeah, And most people won't do it that way, but obviously you've done well in some of your uh, other ventures. Um, and I, so what is one of the toughest things for me? And, and um, I also have a team uh, we've been, you know, we've been doing it for, well, since 2015 is when I think I started the team. Cause I got in and in, in 2000, late 2013, um, and we'll sell around 300 houses this year. 
But one of the one of the things that's tough for me and and for most business owners or team leaders is recruiting and retention, right? And and so I'm curious. What I found in in most in most markets is that agents are attracted to um, other agents who sell a lot of real estate, and because that creates this idea of credibility and influence. And you, I think you said you recruited your first agent before you sold your first property or you'd sold one property. How the hell did you do that? It was somebody that, uh, that I indirectly knew wasn't a good friend, but it was somebody that I, you know, acquaintance, so to speak. And he knew of, again, my background, my pedigree. So just like you're saying, you look at the, uh, the attraction of somebody that is successful. Well, luckily I, I had that success before. So he had known what I had done with my prior company and immediately as, as soon as I uh, became, and then one of my closest friends, actually uh, everybody, everybody laughs at this one, but I've been the best man at both of his weddings. Um, and uh, he, he ended up going and getting his real estate license because I did. And he was on my team for, for a bit. Uh, he was no longer on my team. He's a great guy, great agent. Um, just, uh, just wouldn't necessarily follow the systems. Uh, he was uh, he he kept blaming his uh, lack of attention on the fact that he couldn't time block and do everything. So uh, really good guy, uh, but he just has his own way, and it's not following the systems way. He's successful, does well, uh, just doesn't like the systems. Got it. Got it. So are you the the people that you've uh, brought into your world, um, and now being at EMP, um are you encouraging them to build out their own teams within your team? Uh, not necessarily. I'm, I'm really working with them to, to ultimately build their life. And what I mean by build their life is if their strength is in real estate, uh, building their passive income, whether that's buying investment properties, whether that is helping recruit some other agents, um, but building other lines of passive income and investing their money and doing the things right in order to, create the scenario where while yes, the working in your business means that the money stops if you stop working, but if you set up enough passive income, that's okay. You can stop working and the passive income, if you want to take a couple months off, go on a backpacking trip through Europe, well, you could afford to lose out on the you know 30 or 40 or $50,000 you might've made in those three months because you've got other income and you've you know got enough savings and you're smart with your money. Okay. And that makes sense. I think, you know, everybody does it differently, man. And, and certainly, um, you know, we all joined EXP. Um, th the reason why I joined, and again, I don't want to turn this into a, an EXP commercial is because the thing I think we always had the, the, the toughest time figuring out uh, was that recruiting and retention um, challenge that we were having. And we knew ultimately that um, in building a team, my success or the success of this team was not predicated on um, how many buyers and sellers I personally sold, but the, how many buyers and sellers that the team sold. And so I knew that um, I could have stayed at Keller Williams and we could have provided, you know, an opportunity for those folks. But I also know that if I had stayed there, that was what was best for me. It was not necessarily what was best for my, my team. And, um, I wanted to make the decision to do what's best for the people that um, are in my world. And ultimately, I knew that um, some of our team members have um, um, they have that drive or ambition to want to grow out, go out and grow a team. And now we've provided them an environment in which they can do that. And what's so cool about what we're doing here is that our team members can recruit other team members, we will give them leads. We will train them how to sell real estate mm -hmm. and they will get revenue share from it. For sure. And, and, and yeah, to your point, uh, I, I want to make sure that it doesn't seem like I'm trying to hold people back or pigeonhole them in something. Um, I'm a big believer in let people grow down the path that they want to grow down and that they show their the promise to grow down. So I remember when I was, uh, when I was starting my first business, I obviously left another business and I left in the busy season and my employer was really, really upset with me and he was just beside himself. And I actually gave him four weeks notice and 
He just said, I can't believe you'd leave me at a time like this. We'll never talk again. He was really upset about everything. We happen to be great friends at this point. Uh, but at, in the moment, he was really upset. But I came back at him and I said, I'm really shocked with you. You own a successful business and you've done well. And you're, you're upset with me for wanting to grow, for wanting to be better than I am right now, or wanting to not be better, but again, just, just have an evolution, have that growth. Be where you are, right? Yeah, exactly. You know, so don't, don't hold me down like that. So I'm the same way. If, if I have a team member, you know, whether, whether it's within the brokerage external, you know, if I, I mean, well, the team members with the brokerage, but whatever they want to do, if they literally want to go straight and build their own team and break off from me completely, and that's what they want to do. I pat them on the back. I say, congratulations. That's awesome. I encourage them. I let them know I'm available for help if they, if they ever need it. Um, and you know, I, I hold my opinions to myself. If they, if I don't think that they're cut out for that, I'm, you know, but that's what they want to do, then more power to them. But those that have the strength to do it, and there's a lot of them that do, mm -hmm. then absolutely spread your wings, fly. But if you don't want to do that, then, then don't. And yeah, you could, you could build a team within the team. You can, you can help bring people in. You can, again, form other, other areas of, of passive income. So just like I mentioned, my friend that's not on the team anymore, he didn't do it because he wanted to build a team. He just didn't want to, how should I say, have governance, yeah. right? He didn't want to be governed by anything. So he went out and did it on his own. We're still great friends. I spoke to him last night. I was at his house for the hockey game a couple of weeks ago. We, uh, we went out of or a couple of days ago. We went out of town a couple of weeks ago together. Uh, you know, if he gets married again, I'll be the best friend at his third wedding, uh, kidding aside. So we're still great friends. Uh, so there was never a, Oh man, I can't believe you're doing this to me because it's not about me. Um, so it's funny, you said earlier, you believe that we all work for someone. I actually believe I work for my team. I work for my team more than they work for me. I work for my team to put those systems together. And my, my mantra, my whole goal in getting into this business was to create success for people that either might not have found that success on their own or create greater success for those that would have found success their own. And with an 80 something percent attrition rate, am I going to be the guy that makes a difference to that? Well, it depends on how you look at it. You might look at this five years from now and see the attrition rate is about the same because my difference is microscopic, but I have a, I have a story that I, that I, that I love. I've shared it on Facebook a couple of times. It's not my story. I don't know who wrote it originally, but it's the starfish story. The kids walk in, Beach, There's millions of starfish washed up on on the uh, on the sand, and the water is nowhere near, and they're dying out there. And the kid picks one up and throws it in the ocean, kneels down, picks another one up, continues walking down the beach. And a man approaches him and says, "Son, what are you doing?" And he goes, "I'm saving the starfish." And he says, "Son, there's millions of them out here. You're not going to make a difference." And he picks one up and he throws it in the ocean. And he says, "I made a difference to that one." And to me, that's what it's all about. If there are 20 people, 30 people, 50 people, a couple hundred people that I can make a difference to their life and have them succeed where again, otherwise they might've been part of that pool of attrition agents or have them succeed at a higher level than they would have otherwise succeeded, uh, yeah. then, then I know that I've done good. I, I left the campground better than I found it. So, to speak. Yeah. so that's such a, and you're a servant leader and that's the, that, see, that's the difference, man. That's the difference. Uh, and I actually watched a video on Instagram. I think it was this morning that Gary V did um, talking about people getting into business for the wrong reasons. He says, you know, when we're young, especially most people get into business for themselves, right? They get in business for themselves. They make decisions for themselves. And the reality of it is most businesses fail that get in business for themselves. Because if you look at a business like Amazon, right? See what Amazon Amazon solved the problem, right? They have free shipping, right? Shipping was a big problem for people who ordered stuff online. Well, Amazon created Prime, gave you free shipping, and they solved that problem. See, business owners who get in business to solve problems or to help consumers or, in, 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 in this case, help their agents, right, because the agents are their consumers, if they get in business to help or provide a service for others, um, that is, um, you know, that, that is needed, then those are the businesses that ultimately survive and, and, and not in, in what, what is the failure rate for business in general? I wonder, Alex, do you know that number? 
just for you know, it's interesting because I happen to be uh, rereading uh, Gino Wickman's book Traction right now, and he stated a couple different ones. He stated one that was like fifty six percent of small businesses fail in the first five years. Then there was another association that said that it was uh, that it was like sixty four percent in three years, and then Michael Gerber cites an eighty five percent. Um, failure rate in the first three to five years with another 80% failing in the six to 10 year mark. Yeah. Yeah. So, and, and, so, and, I, and I just, I, I can't help but wonder if, if the reason why that is, is because people get in business for themselves. You know, it's, it, yeah, it's the, it's that as well as the, you know, they, what's it? The, uh, they, they fail to plan. So yeah. effectively they're planning to fail. Correct. Uh, you know, there's a lot to, to do with it, right? And and again, I think real estate is at the crux of that because it seems like I could just get in, I could tell my friends I do it. Once I'm licensed, I'm good to go. I could use the bullpen in the office or if I'm at a virtual brokerage like EXP, I could work from home and I can just do the job. Yeah. And they don't think about it. You know, a friend of mine recently opened a restaurant. And he had to go take out some SBA loans and put a lot of money out of pocket. It cost him. It's a it's a casual dining restaurant. It's not you know and what casual dining it's it's counter service. Yeah. So you go up to the counter, you order. They'll bring it to your table. But it's a uh, you know it's it's better than a fast food. But it's you know about that type of thing, right? Four hundred thousand dollars that he had to put in. And, you know, between all the all the TIs, all of the ovens, all of the equipment that he bought and then his working capital, the 400,000 that did cover his working capital because he has to buy all of the food product. He has to bring on the labor and train them prior to the doors opening. Yeah. And then once the doors open, he's got to have marketing that goes out in order to bring the customers in. And then those customers, those first few weeks, those first few months even. The, the food tickets, the as they call them, the covers, might not even cover the food labor and uh, advertising and other overheads like rent. Yeah. So when you factor all that in, you know, again, he's in for four hundred thousand dollars before he starts even thinking about turning profit. And in real estate, we don't have that because it seems easier than that. It seems easier for two reasons. One, again, I always know people that are buying houses, right? you don't realize they might not use you because they know other people and they might trust people more. Um, and then the second thing is there's big checks. When you think about, you know, that, that, you know, casual dining food place with an average ticket of $15, uh, you know, okay, I got to do a lot of tickets. But when you think about, you know, depending on what marketing you're in, uh, you know, a 5,000 to, you know, $30,000 commission uh, as an average check, it's like, Oh, all I have to do is, you know, six of those a year, or 10 of those a year. And, you know, that's only, you know, one every month, month and a half, two months. Well, you couple that with little or no overhead, right? Uh, out of the gate. Uh, we are very fortunate human beings for sure. It, so it feels easy, but it's deceiving, right? Because if you didn't go in with a plan, if you didn't go in with how you're going to market, how you're going to call your sphere of influence, how you're going to build trust, how you're going to deliver value, come from contributions. So just like I'm talking about doing that with agents, Agents, every agent should be thinking about how you do that with a client. It's not about the transaction. It's about the relationship. And what are you delivering to them? Because you don't, you have to earn their business. They don't have to give it to you. Right. Love it. Love it. Love it, man. We're coming up against the clock here. Um, I want people to be able to, to get in touch with you if they have more questions about, you know, scaling a business or just, um, you know, getting to know you a little bit better. How do people get in contact with you, Alex? Absolutely. My direct cell phone number is 702 219-2000, uh, so pretty easy number, 219-2000, uh, 702 area code. And my email address is alex at therivlingroup.com. So just like my name is spelled here on the screen, alex at therivlingroup.com. Awesome. As usual, I love sharing these stories week after week because I know this show literally changes agents' financial lives, my own included. Do me a big favor. If you like the podcast, please share it with whoever you know might like this podcast. And if you would, uh, or if this is your first time listening to the podcast, please go to wherever you listen to podcasts and make sure you hit that subscribe button. Um, don't forget to visit MikeWallLive.com for eight hours of free additional real estate business training. Uh, for Mr. Alex Rivlin, this is Mike Wall, and we are signing off. Alex, thank you so much, my man. Thank you for having me.
also 